this morning or you're a member or a long-term member, short-term member of our congregation, I have a very special challenge to issue you this morning. Acts chapter 1, we'll begin reading in a moment. The symbol X seems to be the flavor of the month. There are the X Games, Generation X, and now the new branding symbol for Twitter versus the uh, old Tweety Bird, which was that. You remember that's been there since 2010 or 2011. Uh, now Elon Musk got the bright idea to get rid of that, and that's going to be the new Twitter symbol, and he's under a lot of criticism. I'm not sure who cares about that, but nevertheless, I, I want to take advantage of that little circumstance, and I want to use X as the branding symbol for world evangelism this morning. We live in a big world, relatively speaking. It's big to us. It is less than a microscopic speck in the grand scale of the size of the universe. But this planet, with its 8.6 billion people, is the center of God's focus and the center of God's attention. This is where people who were created in the image and the likeness of God live. And because of sin, God is making a monumental effort to focus all of his attention on redeeming, on saving, on delivering, on healing those that are lost and those that are bound. And that must be your and our primary concern of life. This is not a time to get diverted into sin and selfishness, into solely being invested in the pursuit of money and wealth and education. All those things, some of them are fine and good, and we have to occupy our time on earth wisely and fruitfully. But the primary objective is the focus that we must have as God does on the lost. And of course, that's where we all come in. The church of Jesus Christ, you and I, as born-again believers, forgiven, redeemed, set free, delivered from hell, on our way to heaven, have been solicited by God as his only method and means to reach the lost. There is no plan B but you and us. And God expects this to be your primary objective of life. How much thought do you give to this actually? How much of your finances and your resources? Uh, we set aside money for all kinds of things. To buy a car, buy a house, all good. Go to college, our kids, yes, uh, that's good and necessary. Uh, we set aside money for vacation. Uh, but how many of us set aside uh, serious money uh, for the task of world evangelism uh, and have it ready to give uh, when challenged. Today, I want to issue a fresh challenge for us to once again embrace the vision of world evangelism, the call, the task, and the challenge of world evangelism. And maybe you're not taking it as seriously as you should. It doesn't mean that you're doing bad things or that you're sick. We get easily distracted in life. We get caught up with problems and dating and engagements and marriage and having baby. And all of that is good and great and it's part of life. But our objective and our focus and our passion and our zeal and our burden and our challenge is reaching the lost. We have a clear mandate, and it needs to once again grip our hearts. Acts 1, 4. This is after Jesus has been crucified. He has risen from the dead. And these are the last words that he speaks to his disciples before he's taken up into heaven. And the Bible says in verse 4, and being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Which Jesus said, you have heard from me, for John surely baptized with water. 
but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you. This is your task. Don't worry about a kingdom coming. Uh, this is your task, Jesus said. But you shall receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Uh, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I want to ask you this morning uh, to stay riveted to your seat. Uh, let's not have any movement if it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, every syllable, every word, every sentence, every paragraph that I want to share with you, I think is vitally crucial and vitally important. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's ask God for special anointing. Father, we thank you for such great grace, such great privilege, such great, such great honor that you have adopted us as sons and daughters of the living God. You have given us a purpose in life to go into all the world and preach. And, oh, God, let that mandate grip our hearts forever, setting us afresh on fire for you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. The three X's of world evangelism. The first X that I want to look at is the extent of world evangelism. Consider the magnitude of what Jesus is commanding his church to do. He's there with 11 men. And he's telling them after crucifixion, risen from the dead, he's telling them to walk into all the world and preach the gospel. They had no other way to get there. A lot different then than it is now. Now I can get on a plane and I can be anywhere in the world in 30 hours. And a little later this month, I'm going to be preaching a conference in Zambia. I fly from here to Dallas, to London, to Johannesburg, uh, to Lusaka, Zambia. And the total travel time is about 38 hours. And that's about as far in the world as I can get from where I am now. The disciples could probably work, uh, walk rather, or ride on the back of an animal. They could probably travel uh, about 20 miles in that same amount of time and yet Jesus is saying uh, I want you to go into all the world uh, and preach uh, the gospel uh, traveling then was dangerous uh, and treacherous uh, Paul the apostle was robbed and beaten and persecuted uh, and left for dead and shipwrecked uh, shipping was very dangerous because of storms in those days but the command was to go the command was for them to get started. Begin where you are, he said. First, uh, Jerusalem. Focus there. The city where you live and you work and you have your families uh, and you know people. Start in Jerusalem uh, and then go a little bit further from there into Judea and then a little further from there into Samaria and then further from there into the ends uh, of the earth. The command was to go. And as we're going to learn this morning, in my next point, the church has not achieved what Jesus said to do yet. Jerusalem, they got that. Judea, they got that. Samaria, they got that. And the church to this very day, 2,000 years after Jesus said this, uh, after the day of Pentecost, uh, the church is still striving uh, to reach unreached people uh, in the ends of the earth. Uh, and that's your and my mission. The original disciples and the early church uh, could only do so much. They would have had no means or opportunity or ability to get to all the people uh, in all the world. Uh, all the people in all the world hadn't been discovered yet. Uh, in those days, all the world to them uh, was uh, surrounding the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Europe, uh, uh, the Middle East, Asia, and the north of, uh, uh, of Africa. That's all they knew. That was uh, their world. They didn't know about Japan or China or India. They didn't know about the islands of the world or Australia or North and South America. They would have had no ability, no means, uh, no understanding uh, of uh, the world as it was uh, in those days. They could not have gone into all the world. Uh, they could have only gone into their world. So what did they achieve during their lifetime, the early church, I mean? What was the extent of their reach? 
They started in Jerusalem, as I said, where they lived and worked. They built a powerful church there. On the day of Pentecost, uh, when Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost along with the church, uh, and they went out into the streets and began to preach, uh, the Bible says, with many other words, Peter testified, uh, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Uh, and uh, that day, about 3,000 souls uh, were added to them, uh, and the Lord added to the church daily uh, those who were being saved. Uh, so they were fulfilling what Jesus said uh, by going into their streets, their neighborhood, uh, the place where they lived and preached. And then they began to spread beyond Jerusalem. Judea would be like a county up against Jerusalem and stretching down to the Jordan River where there were many small towns and villages. And so it would be very easy and very doable to reach those areas. And then Samaria would be like a neighboring county on the other side of Judea, a little further away, and they fulfilled that in Acts chapter 8 verse 4 therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them so those are the first three parts Jerusalem Judea Samaria start preaching where you are that's what we do we preach to our neighbors we have outreaches in our parks we plant churches in close proximity in the surrounding areas where we live, and then we go beyond that. The missionary journeys beyond Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria began with the Apostle Paul about 10 or 12 years after the day of Pentecost. And they were gathered together in a church they had started in Antioch. And the Bible said as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they set them away. And that began the first efforts of the church to cross uh, international borders uh, and to reach nations uh, as they knew them then, uh, crossing international borders to reach people uh, of different tribes and different cultures uh, and different languages. Uh, and that began in Acts chapter 13 and the Apostle Paul uh, in his three missionary journeys uh, walked uh, 10,000 miles uh, over a period of about 12 years uh, and established uh, uh, many, many churches. And so let's, let's assess the extent of the early church's impact in church planting and in preaching. How far was their reach during their lifetime? One commentator said this about that. In Asia alone, the New Testament mentions churches in uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, uh, and Hierapolis. Uh, Ephesus uh, was really a city full of churches, meeting in homes, uh, and from that work, all the others were started. So while the Apostle Paul started uh, probably 20 churches during his lifetime, which is impressive, uh, what is far more impressive uh, is how many daughters, granddaughters, and great-granddaughter churches were birthed uh, from these churches. Uh, when Paul left the earth at the end of his life, uh, he not only left many church plants, uh, but he left the DNA of a movement that would change the world. Uh, history has changed and was changed uh, in dramatic fashion uh, through this one man's obedience uh, and the extent uh, of his labors, his efforts, uh, and his church uh, planting. We don't have very much in the Bible about the efforts of the original uh, 11 disciples, minus Judas, of course, uh, the original 11 disciples. It is said that Thomas uh, went into India and began to preach. Uh, Bartholomew uh, uh, and James and John went into other regions uh, of Asia and Europe, and some of them went south uh, into Egypt and Africa. But we don't have a record of that. Uh, all we can say is uh, that these men had incredible impact in their world. This last Friday, Emilio sent a um, text to Pastor Warner uh, telling Pastor Warner that Friday, August 4th, uh, was the day this church opened uh, in 1979 and Robert and Emilio's aunt got saved. That one little tiny, dinky, microscopic, single incident gave birth to what we are today. 
Shortly after that, Robert and Emilio got saved, gave their lives to Christ, and the church had its birth, and the church had its beginning. God has blessed our church with incredible revival over many years. Thousands and thousands of people have been saved through this ministry. And when the church was birthed in 1975, it was only five years before we had a disciple that we could plant. We planted Richard Montes and his wife into San Antonio, Texas. And that began what is now 40 uh, four years uh, of faithful church planting uh, into the nations of the world uh, and into the cities uh, of our nation. So I want to just briefly look with you at the extent uh, of our reach, uh, and I want you to take note of this. The word extent uh, means uh, the degree to which something has already spread, its breadth, its range, its scope. Today, the El Paso Church uh, is responsible for having planted churches uh, on five continents. The only continents we don't have churches uh, is Australia uh, and Greenland. And I actually had somebody talk to me about Greenland a number of years ago, and uh, I may send them there. Who knows? No, it's somebody I like. We have churches in Asia, North and South America, Africa, and Europe. And I just put together a very brief uh, accounting, and this isn't total. I didn't have time to do all the research. I would have taken a, a couple days full time. But these are uh, churches uh, that we planted. And what is most gratifying to me is all these churches that I've listed here uh, have planted churches out. The first church we planted, San Antonio, uh, is now a conference center. Uh, they have 120 churches out from just under them. That was our first church planting effort. Now that church has exploded into tremendous growth uh, and revival. And I asked Pastor Richard, just give me a good guesstimate. Uh, and he said 120 domestic and international churches. McAllen, uh, who is out of uh, uh, San Antonio, which would make them a granddaughter church of ours uh, and a granddaughter conference has planted 39 churches. Our church in Houston, Clearwater, Guatemala, Ghana, Ivory Coast, La Paz, Madrid, Tehuacan, Juarez, Springfield, Chihuahua, Oaxaca, Mexico City, San Jose, and El Paso have all planted churches. And then we have many other churches that are not quite there yet, maybe about 40 or so. And so the extent of the impact of the El Paso church since Robert and Emilio's aunt got saved 44 years ago Friday is 258 churches roughly. That's the extent of our reach. Now, I want to talk to you secondly about the expanse of world evangelism. We don't look just at the extent because we're not stopping. Where are we going from here? Where are we going to take this 258 number of churches? Where are we going to take it? What do we hope to achieve going forward? Because there is an expanse beyond the extent. The extent is finite. It's where we are right now, limited this number. The expanse is our vision beyond that because we are never going to stop planting churches, making disciples, and raising money to reach the nations. The word expanse means the total area of something, the distance to which something can be expanded. And so it's necessary that one of the three X's of world evangelism is where we are going. Our next step is to the ends of the earth. That is where we are headed. The, the word there, ends, in the Bible, in our text, means the last place in a series of places. We're not there yet. The uttermost, the farthest extent. And again, we're not there yet, but we're going there. The extent is here. This is the limit of where we've gone thus far. But it's only a launching pad to go beyond that and to reach out beyond where we are now. We have a culture in our church to go and to reach the nations. We spent years sowing the seeds of that into your hearts. And that's what I want the Holy Spirit to set on fire afresh this morning. We have men and we have married couples called of God to preach. 
We have already placed many in the nations of the world. There are many more that are going to be going. We have people that are sitting here this morning uh, that you're not called to preach and to go. You're called to give. uh, And God is going to supply the wealth and the resources sufficient uh, for us to get uh, beyond the extent of where we are now to the expanse of where God is taking us. Consider with me a fascinating way of looking at the mission field. This is known as the 1040 window. That rectangle and the red, I think it's red that you see there. It's known as the 1040 window in missionary parlance. It is a rectangular area on the globe between 10 and 40 degrees north of the equator and stretching from the westernmost part of Africa to just east of Japan, including most of Japan. Take a look at it. Two-thirds of the world's population lives there. 55 of the least evangelized countries in the world are in that 1040 window. 55 of the least evangelized countries in the world are in that 1040 window, many of them never having a missionary visit or a missionary church. 90%, 90% of the people living in that 1040 window have never heard the gospel even once. 85% of the world's poorest live in the 1040 window. Some of those countries, and I'm so blessed to be able to say we have representation in Cambodia is one of those countries. One of the poorest in the world, Nepal, where Nick and Michelle Rogers are. You're going to be hearing a testimony from them directly in a few minutes. Vietnam, where Pastor Ruby has six churches, Eritrea, Chad, no churches there yet, Ethiopia, Pastor Warner just planted a church in that nation, and Yemen. And listen to this. This is the most stunning part of this. Only 10% of the world's Christian missionaries are laboring in the 1040 window. We have to do something. We can't as a church allow that to exist. And if that does not solicit your attention, you're not paying attention to God's voice to go to the ends of the earth. We have three churches in that region. Of the 258 churches, uh, we have three churches in that region currently. Uh, As I said, Cambodia, Nepal, uh, and the Rangels in uh, Japan. This is where I want, put that back up. This is where I want us to focus uh, our attention, but not limited to. We're going to continue to focus on Mexico. We have uh, upwards of 50 churches in Mexico alone, Central uh, and South America. We have the language in our church. We have disciples ready to go into those regions. We're not going to ignore that. We're not going to stop planting churches. uh, But this 1040 region uh, is crying out in desperation uh, for missionary efforts to be launched uh, and deposited uh, into that area. People have spoken to me about Egypt, about Armenia. There are many great cities in Mexico with no fellowship churches. Find them. Those of you that are called to preach and feel an an inspiration to be a missionary, find those cities and pray for them. What we need is another surge into the darkness before Jesus comes. May God give us the necessary urgency and passion. People like you, who were you before you got saved, are awaiting our revival in the 1040 window. Let's never forget, we owe it to the world to do whatever it takes to tell them what we know. 
Our challenge is to do as much as we can, as soon as we can. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit this morning, just as was the day of Pentecost, is to set the church on fire once again for her missionary vision and burden and passion so that our primary focus becomes reaching the nations of the world. This altar is a place for every one of us to respond this morning to the challenge so that we make this happen so that whether you're going to go yourself or whether we're going to be senders, we get on fire for God because the future of our church, the future of our congregation holds the greatest venture of our ministry thus far. The expanse of world evangelism, our vision to go beyond, way beyond the extent of what we have reached thus far is where we are headed. We are headed toward the 1040 window along with other cities and nations who will go, who will send, who will pay the price, who will allow the passion and the zeal of the Holy Spirit to lay hold of your heart. It was the Apostle Paul's great vision to go beyond. He talked about going to Spain. He'd never been there before because of this missionary impulse. And he told the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 10 that his desire was to preach the gospel in regions beyond you. He wanted to expand and extend and go beyond where they were now. Our burden and vision is to go where we have never been, to plant churches in cities that have no churches, to go to nations in the 1040 window that are crying out for a representative of heaven to go and tell them about Jesus Christ. It's farther and farther and still farther. Yeah, we have quite a broad extent. This congregation has made incredible impact. All you have to do is go on one of the impact teams to uh, Tehuacan in uh, San Jose, Mexico to see the extent of our reach and the hundreds and hundreds of people there uh, that are getting saved and have been saved and the disciples, quality couples uh, that are called to preach uh, that have gone to the cities and nations of the world but were still burdened to go further, always further. And finally, I want to talk about the final X. Can you guess what that is? It is the expense of world evangelism. None of this happens without cost. The greatest of our sacrifices, beloved, are still in front of us. The 1040 window, uh, if we're going to reach into that region of the world, uh, it's going to cost, it's going to be expensive uh, in personnel going, uh, in those staying behind and giving. Uh, and of course, Jesus uh, is our ultimate example. Uh, how far was he willing to go? Uh, and it always uh, was for him uh, on earth uh, that the greatest sacrifice was in front of him, uh, not behind him. And I think sometimes we forget and we don't take into account what it costs for you to sit here saved and in your right mind, no longer in prison, no longer bound, no longer in drugs, no longer crazy and confused and lost and suicidal and depressed. What did it cost to get you in your seat this morning? It came at the cost of the blood of Jesus Christ who loved you so much that he took your place on that cross, died for your sin paid the price that you should have paid. He was undeserving. He was innocent. And yet he took all the sins of all the world upon himself. Hebrews puts it this way, not with the blood of goats or calves, but with Jesus Christ's own blood. He entered the most holy place once and for all, having retained, obtained eternal redemption for us all. Going for Jesus. Loving us by Jesus and his obedience to his heavenly father was extremely costly. John 3 16 this scripture struck me once again even though it's most familiar uh, I sent it to my uh, family this morning uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son uh, that whoever believes on him should not perish uh, but have everlasting life. Uh, for God did not send his own son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. God the Father said to his son, you go. And what a price. God is saying to us, go. 
to the farthest regions of the earth, go. Couples will be sent to the 1040 region out of our next conference and other cities and nations as well. For most of the rest of us, going means sending. God the Father sent Jesus. He remained in heaven. He sent Jesus to go and to pray the price, and he was equipped to go all the way to the cross. So let's consider the cost. All of us are challenged to participate. And I think primarily... What you're going to be judged for when we stand before God and what we're going to be held accountable for, how far were you willing to go in order to reach the ends of the earth? Did you actually take on the burden and the vision of Jesus Christ? Did you actually live your life for the same purpose he lived his life? To reach the lost. Our lives only make sense in light of who we can reach. The church only exists today in light of who we can reach in these last days. And if we can believe God this morning, there are no limits. There's not a nation on earth we can't send a worker to. We have personnel, we have resources. If God would open a door and point the way, we can go. Consider some of the couples that we've sent and the price that they're paying. Andre and Marina had no clue that they were going to get sent out of our last conference. But when we sent Nick and Michelle into Nepal, and I didn't have an announcement, I didn't have anybody to take their place, I just had to believe God that he was going to supply someone. Within an hour, uh, Andre and Marina called me and said, we'll go. Uh, six weeks later, they were in Cambodia trying to figure out how to live in this incredibly challenging world. Consider... Nick and Michelle, we're going to hear from them in just a moment. Get that uh, video teed up. They went into Nepal, and he shared with me, and we don't talk about this. Uh, you know it's true, though. All hell broke loose for him. Got sick. This is a bizarre place. Kathmandu, Nepal, at the foot of the Himalayan mountains, uh, high altitude, strange people, strange culture, uh, strange religion. Uh, and here they come landing in this place uh, just on impulse feeling. God spoke to me, Pastor. He told me Monday night of our conference uh, to pioneer a church in Nepal. Well, if you're going to walk into my office uh, during conference and say that, you better get ready to go. We have churches in Colombia, one soon to leave, Bolivia, Guatemala, Nepal again. Here in the U.S., pioneering is no easy task. Randy and Annette are getting ready to open in Indianapolis. We have other pioneer workers in Denver, in St. Petersburg, in Warwick, in uh, Bremerton, Washington, all over the country. So what is it that's going to drive this? One four-letter word, and it has to be in place. Otherwise, our burden for world evangelism is going to wither and die. We're going to start living for ourselves, spending money only on our luxuries. One word drives what I'm talking about, and it's the word love. For God so loved the world. The world wasn't a very lovable place for him. All he'd experienced is a lot of rejection and backsliding after monumental efforts to reach and to take care of and to shepherd and to minister and to heal and to deliver. God's undergone a lot of rejection and abuse. They crucified the Son of God. And yet God so loved the world, his love overrides that because God sees every single human being as valuable no matter how much hatred, how much sin, how much bitterness, how much backsliding, how much atheism, how much false religion is going on in the world. God so loved this world and God so loved people. And if we don't have that love, the compassion of Jesus 
the love of Jesus Christ for the lost. Uh, our vision and our burden will perish. Uh, it will evaporate. It will die. Uh, and we'll be reduced to just living for ourselves, pursuing career, uh, and uh, worried about what the next toy that we're going to buy is. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.14, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And Jesus did die for all, that those who live should live, live no longer for themselves. Do you get that? He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him, Jesus Christ, who died for them and rose again. For the love of Christ compels us, Paul said. God, give us your love for souls, for the lost, from our neighbors to the ends of the earth. Let's hear from Nick and Michelle right now. Hello, friends and family there in America. This is uh, Nick Rogers, me, my wife, Michelle, three daughters, Esther, Celeste, and Abigail. We are currently in Kathmandu, Nepal, been here about three weeks. I wanted to uh, give an update on how things are going currently we are scouting the land and uh, trying to get ourselves a church building and uh, trying to get things going. I wanted to, again, also give a picture of this nation and uh, some of the stats uh, to what we've seen so far. Nepal is a nation of about 30 million. Out of that number, 2% say that they are Christian. Uh, one of the things I've encountered that is a shocker is how many of people that have never heard of Jesus they have no idea of a savior or even of a loving God. The best way I can describe Nepal is how God described the Ninevites. Jonah 4, 11, he said, these are people who do not know their right hand to their left. Now, that's actually a picture of a child who, uh, quite frankly, is clueless, doesn't know which hand is which. So God takes that spiritual analogy and makes an application to the spiritual character of the Ninevites. They don't know right from wrong. That's Nepal. Jesus looked at those that were killing him, and he said to forgive them, but he said they do not know what they are doing. There are nations in this world of people, they do not know what they are doing. As I, again, I've been here three weeks, we are scouting the land, and uh, this is a nation of idolatry. It's a nation of witchcraft, poverty, sin, perversion, and for the most part, this is normal. It is a people don't know their right hand to their left. And to them, for thousands of years, they do not know what they are doing. And this is normal to them. The only hope for those that are around us is the message of Savior, Jesus Christ, who came born as a man, came into this world, paid the price for sin, and loves this nation. The Bible says God pitied the Ninevites. And as I travel around and as we go outreaching and the folks we've encountered, I can feel that pity for those that are around us. It is the heart of God for a nation that's lost and, again, that does not know their right hand to their left. There are several uh, contacts that we have made of folks right now that we are working with, one, am, one man in particular. Uh, he is a young man. As I encountered this man, his English is perfect. He's educated. Uh, he's bilingual. And uh, th this man said the moment we open up a church building that he will be in that first service. And I'm believing that this is the man that God's going to give me. He's going to be my translator. He's going to co-labor in the work that God is doing here. I really wanted to thank the church there in El Paso and also wanted to thank the Los Angeles congregation for partnering with us. Maybe you're not here physically, but your prayers and your support is being accredited onto your account into what God is going to do in this nation. Again, uh, you are here with your tithes and your offerings and your prayers. Physically, you're not here, but spiritually, you are. We're very excited for what God's going to do uh, as we get the ball rolling, as we get a building. Uh, we will continue to send more reports. Uh, again, thank you, and uh, God bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. God, give us your love for souls. Give us your compassion for the lost. Help us to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto the people of Nepal and the other nations in the 1040 region and other cities and nations of the world because we're on our way, church, to the ends of the earth. I want you to bow your heads with me. I don't want anybody moving, please. 
This is sacred holy ground we're on this morning. And God is looking for a response for us all, from us all. And I think the first response should be just surrender. God, I'm going to do all that I can as soon as I can in order to advance the kingdom of God in the earth. The toys we buy, we don't take them with us. You can enjoy them, praise God. But I think Jesus in his commission to reach the nation should be first and foremost above all else. Souls are what's going to go to heaven. Not houses, cars, and luxuries. And I'm for everyone who has money to have nice, beautiful things. God's blessed you with finances and resources as a testimony for what he can do in people's lives. But first and foremost, wealth and resources needs to be channeled to the harvest field. That's what God would expect. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I know this is a little bit of a different kind of a message for those of you who may be visiting here today. But nevertheless, we're here for you. And you may have come to this service this morning and you're not right with God. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have not yet been born again. You know there's sin in your life. You know you're not right. You struggle with depression, maybe suicide, addictions, loneliness, brokenness. Just And if it's none of those extreme things, just empty. We live empty lives without Jesus. We're trying to fulfill it with this and that and the other thing, but... We always fall short, don't we? And we're always left empty. The only thing that can fill your life is when Jesus forgives your sin and makes a great big hole in your life when sin goes away and then there's room for him to deposit his love, his presence in your heart. So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, perhaps you have come this morning as a visitor or one of your first few times, uh, but you're not saved. You're not right with God. You do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have not yet been born again. You need to repent of your sin and receive Jesus as your Savior. I'm not asking you to join a church, become religious, try and improve yourself. Jesus said, unless you repent of your sin, you will perish. We're all sinners. We all need to recognize our sin and say, God, I'm sorry. I don't want to be this way anymore. I don't want to live without you. I want to live with you. I don't want to live against you. I want to live for you. And as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, all that remains is for you to make a decision. That's all that remains for you to make a decision. Pastor, I want to get right with God. I want to know Jesus Christ. I don't want to live the way I've been living any longer. Forty-four years ago, our church was birthed on August 4th, 1979, with a conversion. That's how it all got started. And then a couple of others after that, and then a few others after that, and more after that, and then it turned into an avalanche of souls saved, then church planting. And that's what you need. You need Jesus. I wish I could do this for you, but I can't. All I can do is bring you to a decision. All I can do is present truth and revelation with love in hopes that it'll touch your heart. Jesus loves you so much. He took your sin to the cross. You don't have to pay the price for your sin. He did it. All he's asking from you is to receive that, accept that. There's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way. Why don't you let him make his way into your heart right now? And if you're ready to do that, I want to help you. I want to pray for you. I want to believe God to work a miracle in your life this very morning. And if that describes you, I want you to do one thing. Nobody's looking, every head bowed, just so that I can say a prayer for you. I want you to lift your hand up right now. Lift your hand high. Pastor, pray for me. God bless you. I see that hand in the back. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? You can put it down. Amen. Anyone else? Lift your hand high so that I can see it. Yes, amen. God bless you, ma'am. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. You can put it down. Anyone else? Lift your hand right up. Oh, God, I know that I know that I know that I need Jesus. God bless you over there on my right. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Anyone else this morning? 
This is why we come. I didn't just come to set you on fire for world evangelism. Yes, that, but to see souls saved this morning. That's our ongoing passion. Lift your hand right up and join these that have already done so. Pastor, pray for me. I'm ready to repent and I want to get my heart right with God in the name of Jesus. It's time for you to make a decision. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you're one of those that's been diverted, got distracted. And right now you want to repent, rededicate your life to Christ. I want you to lift your hand. Pastor, pray for me. I'm ready for that in Jesus' name. Lift your hand right up and put it right back down. All right, if you raise your hand, I want you to look at me. Hey, man, I believe you meant that, ma'am. God's touching your life, isn't he, and helping you. Thank you. Way in the back, young boy, you lifted your hand. I believe you meant that. Over here on my left, ma'am, would you come right now and let us help you and pray for you? Amen, Norma, you can come along and pray with her. Thank you. Amen. The young boy right in front of you, CJ, lifted his hand. You can pray with him. I mean, MJ. Amen. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We need an altar of surrender. Have you been diverted and distracted? Life is busy. Life is complex. We have jobs and marriages and money concerns and sicknesses to deal with and overcome and problems of relationship and all kinds of things going on. Yeah, we do. Life is complicated and complex, but don't allow life to hijack all your faculties. We need an altar right now. I think all of us do to reapply ourselves, rededicate ourselves, recommit ourselves, refresh us uh, and renew ourselves uh, in the great task at hand because our greatest sacrifices are in front of us. God wants to give our church marching orders uh, to go to the ends of the earth and for that to occur, we're gonna need an altar of surrender right now. God's gonna equip you, help you, prosper you, bless you, uh, but we're gonna have to be willing. Let's all stand. The altars are open. I want to challenge you. This is an altar for men and couples called to preach. It's a call for everyone else whose responsibility it will be to send. And I want you at the altar on our knees before God, just as was the case in the day of Pentecost when they were crying out to God, Oh, Lord, fill us with the fullness of your mighty power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come and find a place to pray. Fill the altars. God is looking for a unanimous response from our church today oh God we want to go on record fully invested fully willing to pay any price to make any sacrifice to go or to send do as much as we can as soon as we can to go from El Paso El Paso County the surrounding towns and villages and then to the ends of the earth oh God give us the resources to reach into the 1040 window to send workers and laborers into a region that is desperate, oh God. Only 10% of the world's missionaries are in the most needy place on earth. How can we just stand and allow that to stand? Oh God, I praise you, I glorify you, I worship you. I rejoice, O oh God, in your goodness, in your love, in the riches of your mercy. Uh, Father, pour out your spirit over your church. Uh, revive, refresh, renew, uh, and rekindle the fires of revival in every single heart, O oh God. Amen. I want us all to stand this morning. I think the best thing we could do right now before we move on to some other business is get filled afresh with the Holy Ghost. Jesus told the disciples, I don't want you going until you tarry in Jerusalem until you're filled with power from on high. Most of us here would claim to be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
But what is that inspiring you to do? That's the issue. If it's not inspiring uh, to take your place in world evangelism, uh, then it's for naught. The Holy Spirit is not to give you goosebumps, uh, make you feel better about yourself. Uh, it's to energize you, strengthen you, yes, uh, but set you on fire for the nations. Uh, and as soon as Peter and the other disciples uh, were filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, they went into the hostile streets of Jerusalem uh, where they were fearful to go a few moments before. For, but once filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, their burden for souls took over uh, and took control uh, and they preached and 3,000 got saved. Uh, what's the evidence you're filled with the Holy Ghost? It should be an offering uh, for world evangelism. Uh, it should be a surrendered heart to go if you're called to preach uh, or to witness or testify. Something uh, should manifest itself. So we're going to pray for a dimension of the Holy Ghost that will launch us uh, to the ends of the earth. And I want you to pray with me. Oh God in heaven. I thank you this morning for this message of challenge. Lord, let it land in my heart and set me on fire, afresh and anew, to do as much as I can, as soon as I can, in getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so therefore I ask you to fill me afresh with the power of the Holy Ghost that will result in fire and passion, and zeal, and love for the lost, and a willingness to sacrifice and do all I can in order to advance your cause around the world. Fill me afresh. I receive it now. Pour out your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Now let's thank God this morning. Yendere <laughs> Oh, God, fill us afresh. Pour out your spirit. Fire in every soul and in every heart in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. you to find your seats. Nobody leaving the sanctuary yet. Uh, we want to take this occasion to receive an offering and to renew our pledges, and I'll explain how we're going to go about doing that in a moment. The ushers have already passed out the uh, uh, slips, or they should have by now, so that we don't waste time. What are you waiting for? Yeah, get those passed out. They should have already been distributed. Not every conference leader perhaps functions the way that I do. My way is not necessarily better. When Nick came into my office on Monday and said he feels called to go to Nepal, knowing Nick, Nick's the kind of man and his family, I'll follow them anywhere in the world. They say they feel called to go with a wheelbarrow full of money so that we can facilitate what God's called them to do. I don't think about the fact that 
Uh, Nepal is an extremely expensive city. Uh, I don't calculate, can we afford this? Because I know I pastor a church and a conference body that will back the vision and the calling and the destiny that our saved couples feel they are called to go. Uh, one year, uh, for example, Tony and Marina walked into my office and Tony said, Pastor, I feel a call to be a missionary. And there were reasons why that moment wasn't the right time. But a year later, I remember that. And I called him into my office and I said, Tony, remember a year ago uh, you came into my office. Did I? Yeah, you said you wanted to be a missionary. Hmm. I don't seem to recall that. And so I reminded him, and then finally he said, yeah, yeah, I guess I did. Well, Tony, once you open your big mouth like that in my office, I don't forget. And so the offer is there now. And it kind of dazed him. He and Marina left my office, said, we'll get back to you. Within about 120 seconds, they were back in my office Yes, we'll go. They went to Shanghai, built an incredible church there. They're currently in Medellin, Colombia, pastoring a great church there. So here's what we need to do. You all have your world evangelism slips. For those of you that this may be your first time, we pay tithes with, uh, uh, with our offerings, this, uh, with our uh, pay. This isn't that. Uh, we, pay ten, we give 10% of our earnings to the church. That's a command of God. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse. Uh, and as you obey God in the tithe, you put yourself in a supernatural dimension for God to bless you, to bless your business, your finances, your, your earnings, your, uh, your material life. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse and see if I will not pour you out a blessing uh, that you'll not be able to contain. So we tithe regularly. There's a rhythm to the needs of a church. We have to have regular income uh, to supply all the needs of a functioning and thriving congregation. Uh, and that's where your tithes and your offerings come in. And then we ask uh, and we request uh, the Bible talks about offerings besides. Tithing is not really giving. It's just giving back to God what he claims as his own. If you borrow a lawnmower from a neighbor and you give it back to him, you're not giving it to him. You're not donating. You are returning what he says is his and what is his. And so that's tithing. But offerings are what's beside that. And what we really need because we have such a large world evangelism budget. We've been uh, spending somewhere in the neighborhood of eighty to $110,000 a month, literally, in supplying all of our churches, relocating couples, and all the demands that are necessary. And so we ask all of our members to make a pledge, a monthly pledge. You can give it weekly. You could give it service by servant. You could give it as you get paid, if you get paid weekly, if you get paid by weekly or bi-monthly or monthly, uh, you make a pledge. And so we ask you to do that. So the slip here has what your current pledge is. Uh, write that down. What you're currently giving uh, to world evangelism every month. And if you're a regular part of our church and you have nothing to fill in there that's a regular obligation, uh, I hope you're hearing from God this morning because the Knicks of the world need this. So put your current pledge and then put what you're going to do from now on. It might be less. You may be earning less. You may not have a job. You may be going back to school and living with your parents and so forth. So there's room for change either way. I always increase it. Even if my salary doesn't increase, I increase my pledge by faith. I believe God. So write your current pledge and then what you're going to do on a monthly basis. Don't write it weekly or per paycheck how much you're going to be able to give on a monthly basis. That helps us to calculate the kind of budget that we can work with. Okay, so fill that in right now. You can do that. Father, I pray right now, anointing on the membership of our congregation for them to feel the burden to give, to be generous, and to be liberal. In Jesus' name. I don't grasp Christians who don't tithe 
someone who would sit here and not fill one of these out and not want to be a part. This is how you're a part of the Nick and Michelles of the world. In Jesus' name, I want you to bow your head. Father, I thank you so much for this great church and this great people. And I thank you so much for what you have done thus far, the extent of the work as it has expressed itself through this church and this ministry. And Lord, we know we're going to the nations and these pledges are going to facilitate our ability to do so. Now, the second thing that I want to do, if you'll put up the next graphic, is we have to take an offering today. And we're going to raise, did you, you change that, didn't you? No? Looks like it was changed. For the good. I mean, that's the way I wanted it. All right, so uh, this is the current need that we are up against right now. We recently had our air conditionings go kaput, or some of them. We have uh, already spent 50000 on new air conditioners. We have to spend another fifty uh, on their installation. Uh, I don't get very inspired raising money to pay for air conditioning. We can do that. God's helped us uh, facilitate that, and he's blessed us with the resources to be able to accomplish that. But this is the need that we're up against right now. Nick and Michelle Rogers have just moved into Kathmandu. It's a very expensive city. Housing is not so bad, but vehicles, all vehicles have a 300% uh, uh, markup uh, by the government. And so a vehicle is going to cost uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $20,000. Uh, then there are furnishings, getting them in a house or an apartment. Uh, there are furnishings. There's a $2,500 uh, legal fee we have to pay uh, in order to get them legalized in the country. Uh, and so we're needing $30,000 uh, for Nick and Michelle Rogers. Uh, 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 Caleb and Brenda, Caleb has procured a building. We have already rented it. I think we had to pay uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $10,000 up front with uh, three or four months up front rent with deposits and so forth. Uh, now we need $12,500 to remodel that building. The building in Madrid, Spain, we planted a church out of our conference, out of our church in Madrid. They procured a building. They need $5,500 in order uh, to get that building ready and facilitated. Uh, Randy and Annette Jaramillo have moved into Indianapolis. These are very expensive cities. Uh, we only have one church in Indianapolis that is way on the outskirts. Uh, Randy is a little closer in. Uh, the buildings there, uh, you know, the days of getting a building for eight, nine hundred, eleven, twelve hundred are totally gone. Buildings in cities now are two to three thousand, sometimes more. And so we want to raise ten thousand dollars for Randy, his building, equipment, uh, and the relocation there. We planted a church uh, out of our La Paz, Bolivia church into La Paz. Uh, uh, they procured a building. We need $5,200 to equip that. And then Medellin, Colombia, uh, uh, um, Tony and Marina have already moved into a new area and a new building. Um, somebody was just there preaching. Was it uh, Angel? Yeah, Angel Ortiz was just there preaching. Uh, they moved into a new building. The landlord has given us till this month to pay uh, the rent and deposits, and equipping is going to be $6,800. That's a total, if I did my math right, I may have messed up, but around $70,000. So I want to raise that today. I want to raise that money today. This is the cost of world evangelism. We're between conferences now, and many times at that point between our conferences, we need money. Uh, to further facilitate all the announcements we made. Many of you made pledges during conference. Uh, that gets things started. Uh, we need another uh, booster uh, offering. You he heard of boosters during COVID. Well, we need a booster offering this morning. And we want to raise seventy dollars to $80,000 uh, uh, right now. And I want to ask you to do as much as you can today. And there's a place for you to write an amount that you're going to give today. I've written mine, and then a pledged amount that you'll give within two weeks. By the 20th of August, two weeks from today. So give an offering today. If you have it now, you can write a check. You can take out your device. You can give that way. The methods will be put on the screen shortly. So put the amount you're going to give today. And then a pledge that you're going to bring in on Wednesday, Sunday, the following Wednesday, or by at least the following Wednesday. We want to raise 70 
to $80,000. And if everybody does, if 80 people gave 1,000, if 50 people gave 1,000, and another 50 gave 500, we'd meet the need easily. Some of you can give in the thousands. Some of you will give in the hundreds. Some of you will give in the tens. But as long as it's a sacrifice, God blesses your offering. God honors your offering. And the thank you from Nick and Michelle and Tony and Marina and all the other workers is just as much to the one who gives the thousands as it is to the one who may give far less, but it's a sacrifice. Jesus commended the woman who put in the equivalent of a quarter of a cent in the offering because she gave all she had. So I want you to bow your heads this morning, and I hope that the message challenged you. We need to do as much as we can as soon as we can. There are sacrifices to make. You, have may, you may have set money aside for something. Great. Sometimes we need to take that money we've set aside for something, delay indulging in that, and give to world evangelism. We need these monies in now. I've rented a car for Nick and Michelle, but we need the money to buy them one. As soon as possible, they're living in a temporary Airbnb. Uh, I know Michelle. She's hankering to get into her own home and have her own things. And every missionary wife needs that and wants that. They're living in the most bizarre culture, one of the most strange cultures in the world. She needs her place. And they're kind of unsettled, living out of suitcases now. So let's help them this morning. Let's get them facilitated. Let's give as much as we can. So make your offering today, write it where it says today's offering, and then today's pledge by Sunday, August, I think it says August 13th, does it? Yeah, I meant August 20th. See, you already have a grace period. Two-week offering, two-week pledge. All right, let's bow our heads again. Lord, I pray, Father, a move of God in this offering. Stir your people, Lord, to sacrifice, to give large. And in order to do that, God, we need your love and your compassion for the needs of our pastors and missionaries and their families. God, move upon our hearts to give and to reach deep and to make sacrifices and to give from resources that we could use and we need for other things, but to channel them into the direction of world evangelism. And Lord, I give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You can give it in the offering now. Get on your device, uh, write it down, bring it tonight, and then make a pledge. Amen. Let's sing and worship God as we give. The church of God is James. moving. The church of God is moving. The battle has been won. The fall is overcome. We are marching on today. And say goodbye to doubt and give a victory shot. Hey, Church of God, the Church of God. I forgot to the put Church my of God in. is moving. The Church of God is moving. The battle has been won, the fall is overcome. We are marching on today. Say goodbye to doubt and give a victory shot. Hey, church, one more time, the church of God. The church of God is moving. The church of God is moving. The battle has been won, the fall is overcome. We are marching on today. Say goodbye to doubt and give a victory shout. Hey, church of God is moving on. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. Thank you. Thank you for your patience this morning. I really felt very much inspired and stirred uh, for the message when I was stuck in Dallas. Last night I thought, uh-oh, because the first flight they told me I could get on wasn't going to leave until 11 this morning. And so I called, I cajoled, I prayed, I did everything I could to get on an earlier flight and they were able to accommodate me. So uh, I'm grateful for that, for God helping us today, for all of you. 
Uh, tonight, we're going to have a great, great service and ministry with our three-on-three -three tournament. Uh, let's pray for many souls from one end of the altar to the other. And uh, we have prayer at 530. Come and pray and lay hold of God. We made an appeal uh, in our serious men's class a week ago for men that are uh, serious about their calling to be in every prayer meeting along with your wife. And we're looking for that. I had Richard, uh, uh, Pastor Richard standing in the foyer seeing what men who claim to be called are coming to outreach and whether they're on time or not. And I'm taking note of that because if you're not going to take your calling seriously, neither am I. But if you're going to take it seriously, I will. So be in prayer tonight as an example along with others. And we're going to believe God for great, great things. Amen. Our heads are bowed. David Rodriguez is going to pray. Thank the Lord for speaking to our hearts here this morning. Amen. Don't forget uh, chips and desserts for those who that uh, is in reference to. And uh, we'll see you this evening. The Lord bless you.